And uh, Dave, I'm going to hand over to you to uh, moderate the panel. And yeah. I'll be back with some, some closing comments later. Thank, thank you. Everyone. So I just wanted to uh, thank all our panelists for, for going. Um, I'm coming back to our, our slide uh, from, uh, from the Marketunist. And uh, really, we're here to actually talk about how the specific standards of the Open Groups forums are here to actually ease some of these transformations that we've heard about uh, and, and give you a framework for actually developing your workforces, managing your technology delivery, and architecting the necessary components of that transformation. So hopefully by the end of this session, you'll at least have a, a guide to the standards that will make sure that you're not one of the people who is confused about digital transformation. And so I've talked about this earlier. We've got some themes that are clearly emerging, and you heard them time and time again uh, in, the, uh, in the presentations earlier about the need to change uh, a little bit how you do business and that um, you need to reorient both your workforce and how your enterprise approaches its products and move to a, an agile digital first delivery in order to compete in today's market. And if you use the standards you're about to hear about, that'll accelerate your journey to digital competence. Again, I've mentioned these before, but we do have a set of standards that you're about to hear about. I'm going to move quickly past these slides so that you can actually hear from the people who are making it happen. And I think our first, uh, first person is uh, Mark Bodman. Mark but has been well introduced by Steve, but I do want to recognize that he's been one of the real thought leaders uh, in the IT for IT group and uh, helps make this, you know, our standards transition happen so we can help make your digital transition happen. So if we can uh, uh, give the ball to uh, Mark and let you flip the slides. All right, just testing my audio. Can you hear me okay? Yep, hear you fine. Excellent, excellent. Okay. I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about what digital products are. I think they're everywhere already, and I wanted to use my example is uh, a digital oven. About a year ago, we put in a new house, and it came with all these new appliances. And one of the appliances that we got was a, a, an oven, which was digital. Um, so, and it has these features which you wouldn't have expected. I didn't ask for a digital oven. This is just the default oven that came with the house. Uh, but it was digital. It had code running in it, and it had these features to help with programming the oven and interacting with it digitally. Uh, so that was kind of interesting where you can actually scan the barcode for, for food, uh, your food, whatever you're going to be cooking, frozen food or whatnot, um, that would in turn um, go look up the instructions for programming the oven, and then the, those instructions would appear on the oven itself and tell you, how to prepare and what to do next and, and everything. Um, and so that was really cool. And, and, and then I, about six months ago, I got a, a watch, an Apple watch. And it, it even started hooking into my watch to tell me when the food was done. So even if I wasn't around the oven whatsoever, when the timer went off, right, uh, the watch alerted me and uh, had me go back and make sure that you know, my food wasn't burning. And so this digital experience is everywhere. It's profound. It's changing how you do almost anything. And I didn't ask for this feature at all in the oven. It's just how things are done. So digital products are everywhere. And that means that you need to understand IT. What I worry about now in my house is I expect to have this oven around for 20 years. I don't want to change this like as fast as I change my iPhone or the, uh, the Apple Watch. So I, I expect this thing to last. And I'm worried that people that make ovens do they know how to manage IT? Do they know how to alert me when the backend systems are down so this experience changes? So I just wanted to use this because I think if you look around, these are different digital products actually that are all linked together and it'll, the ecosystem will continue to evolve as these additional features and opportunities for, for digital become more apparent. Um, the, the standard that we're representing of course is the IT for IT standard, which you heard a bit from Lars earlier, but the current architecture is, is changing. So it's really built on this service model backbone, we call it, to more of a digital product backbone. 
And you can learn more about what the standard is today by accessing the URL in the bottom. Um, to some of the material that was presented by Satya and Lars and others um, was a little bit more forward thinking around this digital product shift. Um, and some of the things that you're seeing in the industry are things like this project to product shift, which is about being able to invest and manage those products, as uh, Lars kind of pointed out, with a product management acumen to understand exactly what the product is doing for my customers, who are my customers, what are those dependencies that I have, and who what is dependent on my product. So um, we're evolving this DevOps concept into more of a end-to-end -end view of what it means to manage digital products from an IT perspective, but also for those things like digital ovens, which have IT embedded in it and IT dependencies, which we're seeing everywhere, cars, ovens, you name it. Now, the this definition that we're characterizing in the white paper we're coming out with soon is that the you know, digital product is running on code, highly dependent on IT. It provides one or more service. This is where we embed the service management acumen. The idea of being able to monitor and manage the ser your, your customer's outcomes are embedded in IT for IT, but when we get to a product management perspective, it's even more profound because these are your customers and you're interacting with them in a digital manner. So there, it changes the nature of what a customer is in a digital world versus a physical, you know, if it were just an oven that didn't have any digital components. So it's a very different experience. And you have to manage the life cycle. We talk about the system life cycle, but also the offer and the usage. So uh, what that looks like, we'll get to in a minute. Uh, this is the old definition of IT service model used in IT for IT 2.1. There's a white paper on this, and we're rewriting this paper to transform it to digital product, which is on this one. Uh, the, the big difference is on the uh, integration where the machine to machine or machine to human interaction is, is the measured integration. They provide the outcome. Um, the systems are the what we manage, and we call things systems today, but we don't have a, um, a definition of system at, per se in the IT for IT spec. So this basically is generic enough, but, but key to that system definition is the code and the compute, which makes digital product digital. It's the difference between old, you know, non-digital products and what we call digital product. And the similar life cycles, we've got to manage the system itself for in perpetuity. Uh, as long as that thing is running, uh, that system is running, we need to be able to measure and manage the consumption of it, which is request of a fill. That's the value stream that defines that interaction and manages that subscription over the life of the use of this digital product. And the, the more elaborate definition of digital product, you'll be seeing this come out in the digital um, product white paper that, that, that we'll be publishing soon, probably within the next month and a half, two months at the most, is a, a blend between management of products, uh, which is the, the, the top part here, what you're seeing here, but also to management of IT. It's understanding how folks are consuming IT and what kind of systems are being run to be able to provide that consumption experience. And then not only that, but in a IT setting, you have a lot of shared resources. You have people that support your product. You have uh, CICD pipelines that you build to be able to update your product. And sometimes those reach over the wire to the house itself. So my oven gets an update periodically as do cars now and your phone. So all of these things have to be built into the product and thought about. And IT for IT defines much of what you need to manage digital products based on this definition and how IT has sort of evolved to becoming part and parcel to the products that you use. So with that, I uh, wanted to hand it over to my, our next speaker, Jim Doss. Hello, thank you, Mark. As uh, Steve said, I'm, uh, this, my name is Jim Doss and I'm the co-chair of the Open Group's Digital Practitioners Working Group. And uh, just here to talk to you today about what the DPWG has done and what it's doing. organizations providing a digital customer experience.
Jim, we are appearing not to be able to hear you at the moment. There seems to be some problems with your audio. Uh, maybe Sorry, you I, uh, there was just some delay in my navigation uh, toggling. Sorry about that. Um, can you hear me okay? I can hear yeah. you fine. Thank you. Great. So I hope everyone has had the chance to read Design for Digital. So the industry is changing and looking beyond how uh, to simply apply path architecture and program management strategies to the problem of reorienting organizations to focus on value delivery through technology. So there's a growing recognition that new skills and capabilities are needed. So members of the open group are aligned with this new perspective and we're developing new open standards to meet this need. So on the, the principal deliverable to date of the DPWG is the DP box standard. And there are a few things that make this DP box unique. So why is this different than any other standard? Well, the DP box has its foundation in lean, agile, and DevOps, and is comprehensive in the sense that it covers all phases of the enterprise. And we'll talk a bit more about that in the next slide. <clears throat> it's also an open standard. It's a viable, non-commercial, open governance, open source standard. All people can now use that open standard free of charge for their internal use or academic use. So that's one of the things that makes a DP box standard unique, but we've also adopted a unique approach of how we organize our content. So in contrast to lifecycle approaches, the digital practitioner body of knowledge is pioneers a new scaling structure from startup to enterprise and call it the emergence model. And it's one of the DP box key differentiators. The emergence model aims to address many needs at once. And the first is that it provides organization size specific, lean, full life cycle, digital product management guidance. So this means that organizations of any size can mature their digital practices without having to abstract practices from competing or like mostly life cycle based box which due to their organizing principles, generally do not provide such scale specific guidance for all practices. So uh, just at the founder level, the founder context there at the bottom, for example, if I were to extend Mark's story about the digital oven, if Mark and I were founders of a company creating a digital oven or another digital product, we would be concerned with the bare minimum requirements of delivering digital value. As founders, we're only two person team after all. But what are the minimum and essential uh, minimal essential concerns that we must address to develop and sustain a product in a digital environment. Well, um, at the founder's level, we start out with the digital interface on the face of the oven for user interaction. At this startup stage, we typically have little or no concern for process or method, right? Approaches and practices, they're opportunist, opportunistic, they're tactical, they're driven by technical choices such as programming language, delivery pipeline, and target execution platform. From an architectural perspective, automation requirements are minimal, but they're present. The ability to track the state from a uh, digital product or service across a rudimentary build one pipeline is essential from our earliest efforts. So while we were successful and we had to hire a few people and now we're a team, so we're up in the team context. And at the team level, we've added the digital product. Uh, we've added the digital product that brings in the use of mobile phone scanner to get the cooking instructions of the oven. So things are getting more complex. So we have a single mission and a cohesive identity, but uh, we still don't need a lot of overhead to get the job done. But even with a few new people comes the need to more clearly establish product direction. So people are building the right thing. The team is typically uh, all in the same location and can still communicate informally, but there's enough going on that it needs a more organized approach to getting work done. Still, things are getting larger and more complex. The product has a significant user base and its founders, Mark and I are increasingly out meeting with users, customers, and investors. As a result, we aren't in the room when the product team, uh, with the product team as much anymore. In fact, we just named someone to be product owner. From an architectural perspective, further automation is required at the team context as product management is formalized and operational work, such as uh, provisioning and monitoring emerges. And then the team of team context, as our team-based company grew, it reached a crisis point in scaling the digital product. One team could no longer cope as a single unit and, and uh, with the increasing complexity and the operational demands involved. The organization is now a team of teams at a size where face-to-face -face communication is increasingly supplemented by other forms of communication and coordination. The team may get results, but in different ways. The 
the organization needs some level of coordination um, and not everyone is readily accessible for immediate communication. People are no longer co-located uh, co and there are different schedules involved. Furthermore, the organization now has multiple products. As we scaled up, uh, we must now split our products into features and components. And the organization moved from our first product to adding more, further um, to adding more and uh, further organizational evolution is required. So tension between various terms is starting to emerge. Specialization in organization is increasing along with the tendency of specialists to identify more with their field than with the needs of customers. There's an increasing desire among stakeholders and executives to control predictability. Resources are limited and they're always in contention. Advisors and consultants suggest various frameworks for managing the organization. As the organization scales, its leaders need to remember that the highest value is found in moving, in, in uh, fast moving, committed, multi-skilled teams. So losing sight of that value is a common problem for growing organizations. From an architectural perspective, as the organization scales to multiple products and teams, new components are required for coordinating and managing investment and provisioning multiple services and handling operational issues when product to team cardinality is no longer one-to-one. -one. Formal ITFM, Q-based processes of incident change and problem management emerge here as mechanisms for communicating, executing, and assessing risk across team boundaries. As we move up to the enduring enterprise, Mark and I are now running one of the larger and more complex operations with an annual budget of hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. There are thousands of employees with a wide variety of responsibility. Digital is central to our market facing products and in our back office operations. In fact, it's sometimes hard to distinguish the boundaries as our company transforms into a digital business. Agile techniques remain important, but things are getting complex and we're testing the boundaries of what is possible. How can we operate at this scale and still be agile? Decisions made long ago come back to haunt us. Security threats are increasing. And at this scale, there is no escaping the auditors. Our organization has scaled up to a relatively large size. However, what may be less obvious is that scaling up in size also means scaling out in terms of time frame. Concerns for the past and the future extend further and further in each direction. Organizational history is an increasing factory, and the need to manage this knowledge base can't be ignored. Our organization is fulfilling responsibilities uh, set in place by those, by some no longer present, and is building products and signing service contracts to be fulfilled by those who will come after. Hence, the qualifier enduring is applied to the enduring enterprise context. From an architectural perspective, as the organization grows to the largest scale and the longest time horizons, forwards and backwards, a digital, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a digital additional components are required for architecture, governance, policy, assurance, portfolio management, service brokering, supplier integration and management, SIAM, and advanced IT financial management. So there are four contexts in the DP box, and each of those uh, contexts have four competency areas. And those competency areas are placed in the context with, with, uh, it, within which formalization of those practices tend to occur. So just give you a quick minute to look at that. Those are the 12 competency areas in the four competencies. So of course, the open group is always back at standards with the certification program and training ecosystem. So you can now get trained and certified as a digital practitioner with the DP Box Foundation certification. So, um, so what does getting certified uh, with the DP Box tell your employer? Well, it, it demonstrates an understanding that you have an understanding of digital context for business. It gives you professional credibility as a uh, digital practitioner, and it gives you competitive advantage in a job search. And if you look there at the bottom there, there's a link for a lot more information. So in the past few months, uh, we've published additional material based on the standard to help drive adoption and certification. You can take a look at those there. We got our practitioner's pocket, our digital practitioner's pocket guide. There's a new uh, digital practitioner foundation study guide, and uh, there's DP box standard reference cards. So all of those are great options for self-study for those who might not have the time or the money to get into a more uh, face-to-face or a live class. 
Um, and we've also coordinated the development of the guide of, of uh, the principles for open standards at the open group. So the review period for this has already begun. So this review is, is, uh, is now open for members who want to get in and review that. Um, we invite any members to just review that and, and to submit your change request. So looking forward, what's going on this year as we go forward? So we're, we are working very hard to get an update, BTBOX version 1.1. We hope to have that out by the end of the year. Um, we're working on digital standards alignment. And we're looking to enable open comp contribution from the community. And the big announcement for today is that as of today, the DPBOX Community Edition is open for contribution. And there's the link right there. So we've always, the, the open group has always prided itself uh, that its standards are made freely available to all. And as a result, we're establishing a com uh, community repository for the DPBOX standard. We're open to pull requests. And we hope that everybody listening will get involved and contribute. And that's all I have. Great. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, let's hand over our uh, presenter to uh, Andy. And as I see, it's already happened. So Andy, uh, please uh, help us understand the digital view of architecture. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, the first thing that I want to say is that enterprise from open groups definition does not talk about size, whether you are three people working in a garage or 300,000 people working around the room around the world, you're an enterprise. And architecture and all the business process associated with running a business exist whether you're three people or 300,000 people. And the uh, practice of it might not be quite as evolved if you're three people, but it is still there. And everything you do is, um, is an architectural decision or has some architectural impact. And it does come back to haunt you, as, as uh, Jim said earlier. Um, I want to talk a, a little bit about architecture, and there a lot of people say there's a there's a big difference between architecture and the process, which is very um, artifact heavy and DevOps, which is very lightweight and, and runs without an awful lot of uh, upfront planning, and that those two are not uh, compatible or collaborative. And I, I want to talk about an example where um, it, is, it is shown that they are actually uh, compatible and very collaborative. I have a friend of mine that uh, leads disaster response. Um, he, he leads disaster response uh, for a large high-tech high company based in Seattle, Washington. And um, with disaster response, I, I called him up and I said, what are your uh, top three things on your mind and is there anything I can do to help? And he said, Australia, Peru, and COVID-19. And um, if you've never heard of disaster response, or, and thought about it um, when they're from an IT perspective, people are always looking, um, the first responders, they go in and they um, provide medical attention and survival uh, support uh, with food and water and shelter uh, for people. There's also an, an IT component that goes in there. They're looking for their loved ones and they've got to have a way to do that and the infrastructure that is uh, local might have fallen apart. And so uh, IT companies, high tech companies, they typically go in, they drop in uh, technology, whether that's a, a portable data center or uh, connectivity to the cloud or, um, or some kind of wireless capability to, to help stand that. Up. And people will, well, a lot of times put finding their loved ones before they uh, put 
finding a place to rest or getting some food. And once they've got that, then they want to make sure that the people around the world that they know uh, know that they're okay and that they survived. And then very quickly after that, they start worrying about recovery. And that is, what am I going to do about my home? What am I going to do about my business? Um, how am I going to put in for aid and support, et cetera? And with that, the IT capability has got to be customized to each disaster that uh, the company goes in with. And when I asked him if I could help, he said, no. He said, we still have all of our uh, regulatory requirements with GDRP, HL7, HIPAA, et cetera, all of the uh, regulatory pieces are in place. Same with um, all the compliance with our internal legal, internal security, internal data structures, and we have uh, reference architectures uh, and reference uh, <clears throat> designs that you don't have access to, and you don't have access to our uh, experts on the different on the different um, <clears throat> sort of regulatory and compliance pieces. So he said, while you might want to help, you'd be a burden. You wouldn't help. And um, when you're operating in that type of an en environment where it's disaster response, <clears throat> number one priority is to get a solution out and get it out very quickly. But then it's got to be compliant and, um, to everything that um, the organization works with. And it's got to be scalable and reliable so that when people need to use it, uh, it actually works. And what, uh, what they found uh, in these high-tech companies is that architecture has all of the resources, all of the artifacts and all of the connections across the entire organization so that they can feed uh, these DevOps teams that are working. They can help them with data design and with uh, being compliant with the regulatory pieces and, and with security reviews. And they can connect them with other uh, DevOps teams that have already built similar capabilities and um, perhaps find uh, test harnesses that are already developed that they can use with uh, minor modification. And that really accelerates their delivery. And uh, delivery in a digital enterprise and in a digital marketplace is, um, is paramount. It is the, the number one thing people worry about is how quickly they can get it out. So architecture in a digital enterprise and in a DevOps environment, absolutely. Uh, we're working on a, on a TOGAF series guide, which is a form of a white paper that describes how you can use the tools and the techniques that are in TOGAF and OAAF in order to um, inform uh, the DevOps practice. Uh, you saw the, um, and we're also uh, providing EA practitioners who may not know an awful lot about the digital space with the tools that they need to be able to work in a, in a DevOps in a digital environment. So the common points of interest uh, between TOGAF, uh, OAAF, and DPBOC, um, TOGAF is adaptable to digital enterprises, has a lot of the tools and the templates, techniques that uh, DPBOC competencies identify, both their outward um, view, product-centric, and customer-centric, and those are, those are critical pieces. Now, the, the goal of the paper that we're working on is to support, support the digital practitioners uh, that may not know about the TOGAF tools and techniques and could benefit from their use. And we point directly to the tools and the techniques that are relevant at the different levels of, of uh, business function that the DPBOC defines in their context. And for uh, enterprise architecture uh, practitioners, EA practitioners, we are um, helping them with digital transformation. If they're not familiar with it, we're providing guidance on some of the gotchas and how you can use these tools to move forward in a digital environment. Uh, so the approach we're using is we're going to uh, cover both TOGAF uh, and DPBOC. We're going to make sure that the terminology, uh, we clarify that where there might be confusion and we're going to uh, describe uh, 
how the TOGAF standards address the digital age and then how they're going to be a, applied in the different areas uh, of the DP BOC. And looking side by side to give an example of it, this is an eye chart, not for reading, but you can look at it, you can see the four contexts and you can see the 12 competencies. And if you look at one, for instance, operations management, you can look at uh, the TOGAF um, framework has guidance around that. So does OAAF. And so what we do is we provide the information in context with each of those areas. And the way we're doing that is we've uh, organized a small team and we are currently working on that paper. And four members of the open group, if you want to be a part of that and if you want to help us with that definition and uh, provide feedback on it, then there's the, uh, the link to do it. And those are the keys that I had. Uh, Dave, uh, take over. Great. Well, thank you, Andy. I think we've uh, we've covered all of the uh, the key points here. Um, I'm going the wrong direction. Um, so I just want to wind up by talking about where you can get to some of these standards. Uh, you can always find our standards, you know, at um, at the Open Group Library and information on how to certify, get certified, and contribute to our new, um, our new uh, open uh, DPBOC community. So there have been a lot of questions coming in. Um, I think we've got about uh, 15 minutes for Q&A. So uh, let's uh, uh, start with some of these. Of course, uh, people are reminded to put your questions in the uh, Q&A box and we'll try to get those answered. We, we have a way of saving all the questions. We can uh, try to get people to follow up if we don't get to all of them. Um, so I'll ask the, uh, the first one, um, and I think uh, we'll ask this of everybody uh, because we've all got a piece of this. How can a big organization with a complex landscape uh, go into transformation into a digital enterprise? And how does this can be handled incrementally to avoid risk exposure? And I guess I'd ask, you know, how do you see each of the standards we've talked about applying to help guide that process? So uh, let's see. Uh, uh, who wants to go first? I'll happy to. I'll be happy to take that one. So uh, what we've uh, sorry, Jim Doss here. Uh, so what what we what we find is that you know a lot of organizations, yes, they struggle to uh, organizations tend to group at size and scale, and they struggle to go to the next level. But when they do, they're there. Um, larger organizations at the team of teams or the enduring enterprise level, um, sometimes they have trouble acting like a small, nimble organization. Well, not sometimes, very often. <laughs> so um, what you're finding in the you know this digital landscape that we're performing in today is that Organizations are experimenting with downscale digital piloting. So they'll set up some digital initiatives. They'll try to sandbox or cordon, uh, just cordon off that, those digital initiatives from the big lumbering bureaucratic enterprise, if you will. And uh, so they won't be subject to um, uh, some, you know, some governance, uh, many governance concerns or many architecture concerns that are more appropriate for the higher levels of, of the bigger parts of the organization. So the experiment with these downscale digital pilots They'll act. They'll have small team. They'll have teams that begin almost like startups within the company. Uh, you know, entrepreneurship, and uh, they'll they'll uh, they'll they'll experiment digitally with with various initiatives and products and features, and uh, they'll of course bring that feedback in very very quickly. They'll amplify what works well, and they will dampen what doesn't, and they will scale it, and they will try to bring that back up to their to the size of their organization. So. Dampening what worked, dampening what doesn't work. Uh, you know, sort of um, scaling and growing what does. Uh, uh, sorry, amplifying what does work, dampening what doesn't work, scaling then uh, to bring it back up to something that that uh, that meets their large, you know, user customer base. So that's you see a lot of that going on uh, with uh, I think digital. There's there's other sort of digital ways to kick off and start digital, but that's a very common thing that we we see. Good. And of course, I think that's what we were hearing in um, in Mike Fulton's earlier presentation. We was talking about innovation inside a large organization. Um, so, Mark or Andy, any any uh, 
further comments on that question? But I, I guess I, I, Andy. Let's go, oh, go ahead, Andy. All right. Uh, Yes, that's the, the approach I've seen uh, that works very well for getting started is having an, an IT team that is allowed to work outside of the bounds of the typical uh, business process for developing product. And they're, they're given freedom to work in a more innovative way. They do proof of concept uh, by delivering a, a real product and uh, show the value and the speed that they can to de deliver, and then once they do that, then it starts org organically growing across the entire organization. And there are a couple of crisis points where uh, <clears throat> leadership has got to uh, evolve the culture of the organization in order to facilitate um, that move to a, a more agile uh, process. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add on to that. Uh, one of the things that we're doing in the next version of IT for IT is incorporating different value streams, and one of them is called Explore. The idea here is to allow for uh, better understanding of how do you explore new opportunities. And very much if you're familiar with Shark Tank, it's a popular television show about investors investing in ideas, is we want to be able to quickly invest in ideas, try them out in the market, and then invest further if those uh, assumptions are, are true about what you uh, are developing for your market. So this changes how IT is funded. It, it changes the culture, as mentioned before but it also allows you to uh, accelerate new ideas in the market, which many IT shops have been seen as uh, blockers and, uh, and a lot of businesses have gone out and done their own thing. So I, I would say traditional IT shops need to learn to be more agile and there's a lot of changes that need to be made culturally, financial models, tracking these product owners and, and working as teams that are cross-functional versus having too much bureaucracy between teams. These are all shifts that we're trying to incorporate in the IT for IT version three efforts that we're also uh, putting. If I could just add one last comment on uh, Dave to my earlier one. So, I, you know, there's um, statistics show that companies that just try to bring in digital technologies without bringing in the new digital ways of working and uh, a retrained workforce, there's a lot of digital buzzwords out there, but frankly, and I'm finding this in my consultancy, a lot of people don't know what they really mean. They've heard agile, lean, DevOps, um, product management, um, centricity, and they may have read a white paper too, and they think they have digital. When I'm working with them, it's, it's anything but. I find a lot of digital buzzwords being applied to old ways of working and templating on either waterfall or delivering what I call delivering done mentalities, right? So I'm really, really finding in my own consultancy, and I think the literature is supporting this, is that um, you know these new digital, this is what, why we're so excited about the DP box, because and I use, I'm using it all the time in my own consultancy, really getting people to understand the digital ways of working, which are absolutely required <clears throat> with these new uh, injections of digital technology. Great, thank you, Jim. Um, you know, to that point, you know, we've heard a lot about that, that culture of starting small and bringing it back into a larger enterprise, um, the importance of experimentation in innovation, um, and exploring what is possible uh, in digital product launches. So a question of, you know, what do we think about how we can overcome the culture of waterfall thinking and stage dating in order to get that iterative, rapid iterative experimentation? And how do we get to the, you know, lean minimum viable architecture to enable that rapid experimentation? Might be one for you to start, Andy. Great. Um my opinion and what i what i've seen work uh, in other places is that leadership is has got to be uh, shifting over to more service leadership which is something that is described in dp bach uh, and in that case what they do is they define the strategy and the business objectives that um, an organization is trying to achieve once they've, they've done that, then they turn it over to the line of business owners that drive each one of those lines of business. And the line of business owners uh, tell the dev teams, these are the objectives that we've got, got to meet. And they let the 
dev teams manage themselves in order to prioritize and to figure out how they're going to deliver that. And, um, and the uh, leadership is more service oriented where they say, tell me what you need to remove your blockers and I'll do that. And tell me who you need to connect with and I'll, I'll provide that. And it, it becomes uh, driven by the development teams that are very closely connected to the end users. And that's, that's why I've seen um, a structure work and, and it takes a cultural shift in order to, to put that in place, to, to move from being a leader that says, this is what you're going to do, um, and you're going to report back to me every week or two and tell me how you're doing to saying, this is the objective we're trying to achieve. Tell me when you're going to get it done and show me um, iterative releases that are moving towards that. And it feels like you're losing control as a leader and you're really not. You're uh, putting the, the ball in the hands of the best people that can deliver. Thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark or Jim, any immediate reactions? No, I mean, I'm just, I'm just finding that there are, um, there's constant need for digital awareness and training. Um, I'm seeing it everywhere. So we're right, I'm writing a strategy right now for a very large organization, actually rewriting it. It was, it, it come out a while back, but it, it, it needs some tweaks. It wasn't as digital as it needs to be. And there was, so there's, and this is a, a major undertaking at a, at a big organization. And we're, we're, we're challenged because we're putting in some, some, uh, some, some words uh, about agile, lean, DevOps, product management, centricity, integrated product teams, which want to run across functional areas, not just buried within a silo. That's not an integrated product team, right? So it's, we're finding that we can put digital words in, but they don't know what they mean. So there's, uh, you can have digital strategies, but if, if people don't understand what, how, the, how to do those concepts uh, with, you know, the DP box, and uh, and with uh, IT for IT and these TOGAF alignment papers and so on, they're really going to be challenged. Um, they're really going to be challenged to actually do that in practice. And you find there's there's a lot of conflict with. I'm I'm seeing a cultural clash right now in ways of working. The irony is the more people have been working in the last 20, 30 years in IT in the plan, build, operate mode, left to right, the, some of those people can be the hardest to get think from outside in right to left. So that's the huge challenge that I'm continuing addressing where I'm having the most success when I do su address it uh, successfully and uh, what I think is going to be a continued thing for the next few years. Yeah, I would say that there's two problems and they're coming together. One is digital native companies that grew up with a digital product in mind. They, they typically are, especially newer techniques, agile techniques were, were used. Um, they're struggling to become, you know, quote unquote, mature IT organizations because they, they put a product out and they, ha they have to evolve, but they have to do it properly because you're now dealing with scale and complexities from a regulation point of view and all kinds of other moving parts that larger, more established companies already know. And then the second problem is really for traditional IT organizations to become more product centric. Um, we're kind of grounded in legacy and, and the way we do things, the tools, the processes that we've established over many, many years. Uh, and so they're struggling to kind of shift into that product centricity and be agile. And I think that what we're trying to do as an industry is to bridge these two so they coexist. It's not one or the other, but it's a bit of both. And I think there's some concepts that help organizations understand that um, and how to apply, you know, both both levels of thinking in the same organization without breaking one of the other. Well, if I if, and if I could just add to that, Mark, what we're finding as well is that um, uh, you have to understand when some old ways of working are negating some of your digital uh, sort of efforts. So again, I, I just give you an example. I just had we had we have a we have an organization who wants to use integrated product teams, so they've grabbed onto the buzzword, but they're using it like a project team, and it's very stage gated. And so there's an engineering IPT, <laughs> there's a design IPT, there's an operation IPT, and they're different. They're not a one persistent team. So I, I think an organization also has to understand where old ways of thinking uh, can run counter to and really understand that dynamic uh, and understand where their, their old ways of thinking, they're, they're bringing in some digital concepts, but they're not using them properly. So that's, 
That's something, so yes, where they can both coexist. We're not going to get rid of project management overnight. That is certainly not going to happen quickly, uh, but you're finding product, project management and service management looking a lot more like product management today when you're looking at the latest releases and so on. So um, it's, I think it's an interesting time, but an understanding where those can be counter to one another is very, very important. It's kind of like it's, you have the digital terminology, but you're still living the digital anti-patterns. And, and adding on to that, uh, it is, that's absolutely correct. Uh, you've got the, the notions, but you haven't modified the business process in order to implement those and make sure that they're going to work. And, and so the, the idea is there, but uh, tactically how you do it in the step-by-step -step, uh, doesn't get implemented. Great. Thank you. If our speakers were all so concise, we've got a fair amount of time for questions, so please keep them coming. Um, I want to read one from the question stream because I think we've covered this. There's been a lot of discussion in the question stream about product versus service, and I think you guys have addressed it very nicely. You know, obviously, to some extent, you know, you're, you will have products delivered digitally, but those are actually also going to be, to some extent, backed by the service that you provide to your customers to allow them to interact uh, with your, your product delivery team. So Yeah, I would just like to add to that one. I think the main difference from a product team perspective is that code is running somewhere to deliver the outcome. Right. If you think about digital products being different in that way, then I think you can make that transition. And your customers can be internal or external um, or partners, right? You're, you, you might be part of a larger ecosystem. But it's, it's really having a product-centric mindset when you think about the full life cycle and also understanding your customer and evolving those products over time because nothing stands still. You always have to uh, keep the code coming, if you will, so that you can incorporate new features and, and you know, kill bugs as they're identified. So I think somewhat related to that, the question, in the case of organizations from the manufacturing sector that deliver physical products into the market, how can they make the shift to becoming digital? This is Andy. I'll, I'll take a, an initial stab at that one. Um, what we're finding, in, and you saw that in uh, Mark and Jim's, uh, their, their opening uh, scenario where the oven, uh, becomes connected to a smartphone and, and watches and devices. Uh, those are ways to do that. And the, and the IT teams uh, that are working around a product, they, they're the best to uh, envision and to provide that innovation to say, boy, I sure wish that I could do blah. And then they can define and evolve that a little bit and push it out there. Uh, and one of the challenges that, that I was going to speak to is, what happens if you have a digital oven that gets hacked and somebody burns your house down? Uh, so there are compliance and regulatory pieces that, that come up and Jim, uh, Mark and I had a, a fun little discussion about that and how those things uh, do need to be looked at and, and where uh, architecture and where all the compliance and governance needs to come in. Yeah, I, I, think, well, I think that's a, I think that's a great question. It's almost like a microcosm of the whole. So you, you see like, um, you know, this goes back to the turn of the last century with, um, you know, uh, mass production, production line, uh, and just all that reduction is sort of approach. You're, you optimize supply chains, you minimize your, your costs, you maximize your profit, and you're really about getting, you know, it's reducing variant, like the Six Sigma approach was the kind of the, you know, the, the height of this, right? Reducing variance. Uh, on your uh, on your product quality, right? So that you have a standard of quality for everything that comes off the line, and uh, and and so we're seeing this kind of different thing. That but when when an oven manufacturer or a car manufacturer gets into a digital space, as as Mark and Andy said, you know, I want to know they know that they're in a different space, that they know how to manage IT. Uh, Mark tells me that there was an, a, a stove in, installed in his house as well, but it got recalled because it actually did get hacked and it could be turned on. So you know these are they did actually put more time in the stove than the in the, in the code and the uh, in the uh, you know the actual digital aspect of it. So um, they're in a very so you find that people that are manufacturing physical products, if it didn't start out as a digital product um, with you know the physical component of it too, they're they're in a new space and they might not understand that. 
and that's that's really really you know, all the rest of this conversation sort of plugs in here. Yeah, I actually yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to add, you know, the the thing for a product manager, that's my day job as a product manager here at ServiceNow, and I'm always thinking about better ways of making my product work without having to invest in the ground-up idea, like to, to link in other products or, uh, you know, extend into my ecosystem or leverage technologies that weren't uh, available in, in my product uh, recently or, diff, you know, recent, uh, other generations of the product or even my competitors. So uh, I think the opportunity to, le to leverage compute, um, interfacing, real-time connections, social data, right, media, um, be able to, to leverage other folks' data as a service. Like in the oven, I worry about, you know, the foods 20 years from now. Well, those foods still work because there's going to be different barcodes and different uh, cooking instructions needed. So the, the ecosystem just expands, but also the opportunity if you're clever and you think outside the box. Uh, of course, the regulations are, are the tricky thing. You don't want to go so outside the box that you're leaving your company for um, – uh, in a liable situation with whatever product you're, you're coming out with. But I think there's a, for technologists that are, you know, uh, that are aware as a product manager in today's age, you can do a lot with just a very little knowledge these days, in embedding computers or RFIDs or, you know, um, technologies in ways that just nobody had thought of. You know, Mark, I, I, I think that you're, you're on to a, a very important idea there. And I think part of the, the change we're seeing is this, I, these digital concepts are forcing these traditional, you know, you know, hardware product-oriented manufacturers, physical product-oriented manufacturers to re-envision what a product actually means to them. I think there's a really good case study that's fairly easy to find about GE, where they, they completely reoriented from, oh, here's an engine, here's a jet engine for your plane, to here's how we're going to maintain this jet engine no matter where it is in the world, you know, no matter what parts you need, they track the life cycle. And the life cycle management of their product was the service and not just the delivery of the product. So I think that's, that's you see here, these leading ideas in IT growing out of people who have purely digital delivery to people that have physical delivery starting to re reshape the way they actually uh, model their business. So we've probably got time for one more question. I think there's uh, to take it back to the uh, the standards view of the world, um, and I'm going to generalize a question I got here. We originally got a question: Can you touch on you know why there's both a the a o a a f and TOGAF standards? But I think the question I'm going to ask is a little bit more general. We've got standards that are each innovating in their own space: DP, BAC, o a a f, you know TOGAF and and IT for IT. You're all leaders in this. How do you see them coming together? Do you see do you see that happening smoothly? Do you see rough spots? Where do you need help? Uh, I guess I'll go first. Um, you know, from an IT for IT perspective, we we started out with really this service focus, and then we transformed to digital products. And what we're we're finding is that we can integrate ideas from each other, from the different um, forums and the other activities, and shared concepts or shared ideas. Uh, one of the things I like about this whole uh, thing we're doing in this forum now is we're, we're coming up with a shared set of principles. So we all, all operate and kind of fill in the gaps wherever those principles apply to the, to the standards work we're doing. I think that's uh, really critical. So we're all on the same page at least, but each forum is kind of out to solve a different type of problem. And I think that's important too. We, we still need to be able to solve the problems that we are set out to, but then at least co coexist and integrate wherever possible so that we're not, uh, we're not doing this in, in different directions. We're kind of aligning our decisions and our terminologies. Uh, and that, those are the kind of, that's the kind of help I think I would say to kind of answer your question, Dave, is folks that kind of live in different worlds, if you're doing IT for IT and architecture, can you uh, help with evolving how that comes together? Or DP Bach, if you don't have DP Bach now and you want to start using it and you're an architect, you can bring that into your uh, your place of work and, and be a champion there. And I, and I think it, what's going on with these digital standards, which are notable digital standards, right? They reflect what's going on with the industry. 
And I see what's going on with the Open Group's digital standards portfolio. It's the exact same thing that's going on right now out in the industry. You are seeing uh, an, it's an amazing time, a lot of new paradigms, new paradigm shifts, these paradigms all informing and influencing each other. It's a very, very, uh, it's a very exciting time to be in IT. It's a very exciting time to be in digital. Uh, it's a very exciting time to be in business. And um, increasingly, no separation between those two is being seen by business going forward. So it's, it's, it's been very exciting here at the Open Group. But I would just say it's reflective of exactly what's going on. And it's been fun. And there's lots of great conversations and ideas flowing back and forth. It's a great time to be involved, honestly, in, in working with the digital standards at the Open Group. And uh, to add on, on to that, the terminology, I think, is, is critical. The way that we communicate is uh, extremely important. And when I started my uh, part of this discussion, uh, I qualified uh, what an enterprise is based on the definition the Open Group uses. And um, <clears throat> we have so many terms that we've got to do that with. All of the, the new digital language uh, can be confusing to an awful lot of people, and everyone has their own vision that they have with that. The same with architecture, and the same with platform, dare I say it. Uh, everyone, you use those words, and they're very polarizing. People see them for what they think that they are, and from their background. And I think that providing a common terminology and then providing the relationship between these different um, frameworks is, is a critical piece. And, and that's why I'm involved in the, the glue part of it. Well, that's a great place to end, you know, to hear you know, Jim's reflection that we're really here right at the cutting edge of where industry is and that our standards are, are follow, you know, following that along as close as we can. And Andy, a good reminder that it is hard work, but it's what the open group does. We bring people together to hammer these things out, sometimes a little painfully, but we do hammer them out eventually and know that we can actually produce that standard, those standards for everybody to use. So we are up on our time. I want to thank my panelists, uh, um, Mark Bodman from ServiceNow, Jim Doss from IT Management and Governance, and Andy Ruth from Sustainable Evolution.